having the ability to make some money from bug bounty hunting could change the way we live, we operate and work, and just change our day-to-day due to the fact that it's a completely brand new career path with a lot of return. The lot of return that I mean in this is that it just can make a lot of money and it could change your life. You can retire your family. You can make some money for yourself and build a career working for yourself, just like I've been doing in the past year or so. Now, before you're able to make this a full-time thing to make money from it, we need to start achieving these smaller goals of starting with making a certain amount of money every month and then bumping that up to more and more as we learn and gain more skill sets that could help us contribute to that goal. So with that said, for this to work, we're going to talk about three main things. And the first goal with this video is to help you find a way to just simply make between a thousand to two thousand dollars a month. Because personally, I think that that goal is very doable, especially thanks to all the bug bounty platforms and all the bug bounty programs that are out there. And a lot of them pay a decent amount of money between three to five hundred dollars for medium vulnerabilities that makes achieving the two K a month or the two thousand dollars a month very very possible earlier i mentioned that we're going to break this down into three different components and the first one to start off with is the mindset that's how you think and how you operate and how your day-to-day is when you approach bug bounties the first thing is that you cannot go into bug bounty hunting with the mentality of i'm not going to find anything and psyching yourself out because that's honestly with anything in life the more negativity you bring to it the chances of you accomplishing that goal is going to be less less so when you're going in this you have to go with a positive attitude and be hopeful that you're going to find vulnerabilities and leave all that negative stuff in the past and behind you when you're doing your bug hunting now that we got the negativity out of the way and we pushed it back and put it behind us in the rearview mirror we need to talk about the approach on how we look for bugs so with that said you want to forget about all these crappy vulnerabilities that aren't going to get you paid these are things like your rate limits your missing headers the best practices maybe things that you'd see on a day-to-day pen test because you have to report them those don't really work in bug bounties and i'm going to probably die on this hill of always asking the questions maybe in the next 20 years i'm going to always ask this question if you can't answer the question how do i affect a company's infrastructures or customers with this vulnerability then chances are you don't want to report that and obviously things with rate limit could affect the infrastructure in some way but what is the impact of that vulnerability if you can send a thousand requests on endpoint so what what can you do a lot of denial services unfortunately are not a part of bug bounty programs and not something that you're going to get paid for and the last bit to the mindset component is what i want to call the ctf approach this is what i think ctf players have a really good advantage when it comes down to bug bounty hunting because they are relentless and as i say that i don't mean that you have to be a ctf player but the mindset of ctf players is that they are relentless there's always a solution to whatever problem they come up with and if you look at some of these top bug bounty hunters and some of these top hackers in the world you will see that nothing stops them from achieving that goal or whatever their mission is even if it's to find a vulnerability so that means you have to look for ways to solve your problem and ctf players are mentally prepared for that because they're used to having a solution to any ctf level that they approach so if you see something that's a blocker whether you can't sign up you can't access an endpoint or if you just can't see a page those should be things that you need to problem solve on your own and find a way to get around it and not quickly give up and move on and speaking of ctfs i gotta quickly give a shout out to sneak for sponsoring this week's video they're actually holding a capture the flag competition or what they call a fetch the flag with no one other than my fellow content creator john hammond and this ctf starts off on october 27 at 9 a.m eastern time and it's only going to happen for 24 hours so you can play as little as you want or as much as you want and it is going to have almost 30 challenges anywhere from beginner friendly to advanced topics on binary exploitation and web. So gather your team and sign up using my link, sneak.co slash nahamsik for a chance to win a Nintendo Switch. Enough about that, let's talk about the second component. This one is your approach to how you want to do bug bounties. And I promise I'm not gonna go on a rant and talk about this whole automated versus manual approach. But do me a favor though, drop me a comment. Let me know, what do you prefer? Do you wanna do manual or do you wanna do the automated approach? And maybe I'll make a video based on it. So maybe you can comment something like manual, automated or both, but honestly, Your approach determines what you're going to be doing when it comes down to bug hunting. So if you choose the automated approach, it doesn't mean that you have to be lazy and just, you know, use these different templates and tools that you're going to find online. It just means that every day you have to be creating 
new things, new templates, new tooling, new ways to find vulnerabilities. So in other words, the automated approach doesn't necessarily mean that it's easier. In some cases, it may actually be a lot harder because you have to always look out for new vulnerability types and everybody else is doing it. So it might just be a little bit saturated, but there is ways to make money. And I think when you do automated vuln scanning across the entire bug bounty ecosystem, you're going to find a lot of lower severity vulnerabilities. Don't get me wrong. You are going to find some good bugs like SSRFs and RCE through recon, but let's be real. It's you're using the same method as everybody else. So you have to find your niche and build on it every day. So let me recap that again. I'm going to just make sure I get this point across. Recon doesn't make it any easier. Every day you have to import new assets, new phone types, new exports, new CVEs, new templates, you name it, you just got to be on top of it because you want to be the first to find it and the first to report it in order to get a bounty out of that. The second approach is your manual approach. And I personally think if you are a new bug bounty hunter, this should be your approach to do manual. You know, recon should be super, super small and it should just get you assets to hack on and you sign up and log in and do the manual approach. Because if you're doing automated scans, if you're doing content discovery and you find an endpoint that is vulnerable, but you have zero manual hacking experience, you're going to miss out on vulnerabilities and that's because you don't know how to properly exploit them. So if you're new, you wanna take my advice, Honestly, go for manual and learn and become very, very comfortable with these vulnerability types before you jump into the automation approach. And this whole manual approach means you have to go more in depth with the company itself. You have to understand the different assets they have. How do these microservices talk to each other? How do they contribute to the core business or the core application? What are the different APIs? And create an entire map of those assets and start hacking on them one by one in hopes to find vulnerabilities. There is a third approach to this. And I know some hackers that do this, they have a really good scanner that scans for vulnerabilities and finds them some stuff and they don't spend a ton of time on this. It's just what I would just call it a revenue stream of some sort for them. They're not worried about it being duped. They file it. If they get paid for it, they get paid for it, but they do both. They're doing manual scans. It's finding things. And in the meantime, while the scans are running while they're asleep or while they're hacking manually on these other targets, they're bringing them together for more bounties. I'll make a video on this. You got to drop me a comment and let me know if you want to hear about this, but that is also a second thing you can do. All this whole approach thing depends on your experience, what you're comfortable with, and it is 100% based on personal preference. And the third approach, and I think this is something that a lot of hackers kind of lack is the vehicle, or what I would call the bug bounty programs that you hack on. And it's really, really important to pick the right ones. And, and there are a lot of different things that go into this, but honestly, it's easy to pick a good bug bounty program based on their activity. So if you go to bug bounty program in the last 90 days, you see that their activity hasn't been much. Maybe they have only paid a couple of thousand dollars in bugs and those couple of thousand dollars only translate into a couple of maybe mediums or high vulnerabilities then probably not a lot of bugs are going to be found on this bug bounty program, which could be a good or bad thing because either A, a lot of hackers aren't looking at it, or B, this company's attack surface or application is very small and not a lot of vulnerabilities could be found. On the other hand, the second thing is you want to look for active program. That means that this company is actively being exploited and hackers are finding vulnerabilities, which could increase the chances of finding duplicates. But honestly, a duplicate is better than no bugs because that shows that you are getting closer and closer to finding a valid vulnerability. So look at the 90 day results. For example, on Hacker One, the top right corner, you can see how many bugs have been paid, how many bugs have been triaged, or what are the bounty amounts, what is the average, and so on. So look at those metrics. Make sure you're using those metrics in your advantage to pick a good bug bounty program. And that goes without saying that you want to also make sure the minimum bounty amounts that they're being paid is something that you are comfortable about. If you want to read more about my approach to this, I'll link it down below. I have a blog post on this on how I pick my targets since I've gone full time with bug bounty hunting. But please keep that in mind that you have to find programs that are actively getting hacked and paying bounties on whatever bug bounty platform you go to. On the topic of finding the right bug bounty program, do me a favor, if you pick one, pick something large, whether it's that they have a lot of attack surface based on recon or the applications are huge. This could be your programs like Snapchat, Airbnb, Amazon, they're all on Hacker One. they're huge. Pick something really, really big that either the application itself is huge or the company's infrastructure is huge and you can find different applications to hack on. I am a big advocate of finding momentum. That means if you find a vulnerability, 
If you find a pattern of mistakes, you want to continue to look for those vulnerabilities and find and exploit and report more and more of those. So that means if you find a pattern of mistakes in an API with IDORs, continue to look for those and don't quickly move on until you have rinse and repeat it. And honestly, it doesn't hurt to share these patterns of mistakes once you're done with them with another hacker, another friend to collaborate with. Maybe they will find something to build on top of this that you may have missed that you can collaborate on with each other and make more money together. Honestly, there's been a number of times where I found some really cool bugs. I've completely went through an API and found as many of them as I can. And then later I got tired of it. I stopped, I couldn't find more. And I shared it with a couple of friends where they either found more vulnerabilities similar to the one that I shared, or they found something that opened up a completely different lead for us to hack on that bug bounty program and find more vulnerabilities. So share with your friends, find people to collaborate with, and honestly, don't move on very quickly. And I know I said there's only three parts of this video. There is one last thing. It's not really a component of this, but please do me a favor. If you do hit your goal consistently, maybe you do it for one or two months and you hit $1,000, go out there and celebrate. Go spend some of that bounty. It doesn't have to be the entire thing or a large portion of it, but go grab dinner, go grab some drinks, celebrate the small wins and remind yourself of why you hack and do bug bounties and work so hard to get you to where you are. So celebration is a big part of it. Celebrate those small wins. And last but not least, if you like videos like this, hit that subscribe button, like the video and drop me a comment. And I'll see you all in next week's video. Peace.